The extent to which we are influenced by others is dangerously severe. We are individuals living in an individualistic society, yes, but the way in which we operate as a species is more akin to honeybees and termites, rather than solitary felines or rogue grizzlies. Like the termites, we have an organized society with clear divisions of labor, i.e. workers, defenders of the colony, and king and queen-like figures who, if not responsible for reproduction, are responsible for the growth and management of the colony. These key features give rise to what is known as a superorganism, or in other words, an organized society that functions as an organic whole. Humans are fortunate, however, because while many group selected species, such as ants, bees, and termites, have large numbers of sterile workers and soldiers, our workers and soldiers have the benefit of directly passing their genes into the next generation for their heroic and laborious efforts. With that being said, until fairly recently, much of human offspring did not survive, and mortality rates in Europe until the Industrial Revolution have at times reached 50% or more, numbers that weren't uncommon in other parts of the world. Only the most genetically endowed offspring were able to survive, while the others perished in infancy or early childhood due to the inheritance of harmful genetic mutations or other environmental factors. This is a process that evolutionary psychologists call natural purifying selection, a phenomenon which exists to ensure only the most qualified of the species is allowed to breed. We live in vastly different times now, and innovations in medicine and nutrition have allowed us to drastically decrease the infant and mortality rates, but with that luxury comes the attenuation of the natural process known as purifying selection, a mechanism which minimizes the propagation of deleterious genetic mutations throughout a group selected population, mutations which, although fatal in the past, are now successfully treated with palliative measures, and with a reality of measures to treat these afflictions comes debatable questions of quality versus quantity. As I intend neither to portray myself as a humanitarian nor a eugenicist, I'll refrain from venturing to answer that question and instead focus on simply presenting the research in relation to the matter as it exists. Before I continue to illustrate the potential result of the spread of mutations throughout a population, it is important for me to mention that, as the brain makes up nearly 85% of our genome, mutations of the body tend to be comorbid with mutations of the mind meaning that those who harbor physical abnormalities often have mental ones as well, which tend to reflect as maladaptive thoughts or behavior. And while bodily afflictions have little bearing on the surrounding population when treated, mental abnormalities could have devastating effects on not only the carrier, but also those they come into contact with. Researcher John Calhoun conducted an experiment in 1968 called Mouse Utopia, which was, or seemed to be rather, exactly how it sounds. The experiment took place in a 9x4 metal pin with eight mice planted into a universe replete with nesting boxes, food hoppers, and water dispensers. And there they remained for two years. At first, the title of the experiment was justified by the immediate result, which was the rapid expansion of the community from only four pairs to nearly 2200 mice by day 600. Though that number may seem large in comparison to the original eight, the habitat had enough nesting space to allow up to 3,840 mice in total. The expansion of the general population boomed initially, but the growth had slowed down dramatically from days 315 to 600, and with that decline came other odd results, such as a collapse in social structure and normal mouse behavior. The rodents had begun wounding their young and expelling them before weaning was complete. The males were unable to properly defend their territory due to a decrease in testosterone, and females and males swapped gender roles, with the former behaving more aggressively than the latter. After day 600, which is when the population hit its maximum, the precipitous decline began and it didn't stop until extinction. During this unprecedented decline, females were unable to reproduce, as the males had withdrawn completely from the mating scene and instead chose solitary lives in which they did nothing but eat, sleep, and groom themselves. These mice, due to their sleek coats and fastidious regimes, were known as the Beautiful Ones. The Beautiful Ones, although pestered for sex by aggressive female mice, chose to stop reproducing entirely, the end result being the collective death of the community after the phenomenon Calhoun termed the behavioral sink occurred, 
Calhoun eventually concluded that the morbid end result of this experiment was attributed to the competition and stresses of the individuals leading to the behavioral breakdown which caused the demise of the population. However, many years later, mice such as the beautiful ones who exhibited solitarism, lack of interest in sexual cues, autistic-like behavior, and abstinence of communal activities were eventually linked to actual genetic mutations. With the discovery of these mutations within the mouse population by later researchers, new experiments were conducted using the original model of mouse utopia. In these new experiments, the concept known as social epistasis arose, which is the effect of a particular agent or ego on another's phenotype, phenotype being the way one's genes express themselves. To put this into perspective, Imagine an individual as an ego that expresses itself as a result of its genetic inheritance. Now imagine that ego coming into close contact with other egos, and that individual ego being altered by its interactions with other individual egos. And because an ego was interacted with in a particular way, their developmental tract becomes altered, leading their genetic expression to deviate one direction, when it naturally would have been inclined to another had the individual ego remained unperturbed. The effect of this exposure can cause social epistasis to become amplified, which can result in the decreased fitness of a population through interactions with egos carrying high degrees of harmful mutations. Michael Woodley of Mani, the researcher who devised the social epistasis amplification model, tested his hypothesis using different incarnations of the mouse utopia experiment primarily to discover the effects that mutant mice, or in other words, the beautiful ones, had on normal populations. As it turns out, the exposure of the beautiful ones caused the phenomenon of social epistasis to arise, which transformed the formerly normal behavior of the mice to resemble that of those infected with mutations. Testosterone levels dropped rapidly, the mice started to develop social aversions, and the strange behaviors common among the beautiful ones started to manifest universally. Essentially, it was suggested that exposure and subsequent interaction with the mice harboring these mutations caused systematic changes in gene expression among the mice who would have otherwise developed normally. Now, while many people may be hesitant to apply the social epistasis amplification model to humanity, the fact remains that we too have phenotypic expressions that are capable of being influenced by others positively or negatively. One need only to observe collectively agreed upon cultural practices among a community or impressionable young people modeling themselves after their idols to come to terms with that notion. But with the acceptance of the reality of social epistasis comes the question as to whether or not positive or negative influences are occurring within a given population. To answer that question, one must examine the extent to which humanity observes fitness costs that correlate with the accumulation of deleterious mutations. It is important to note that certain phenotypes, which would have had fitness costs to a particular group, would have suffered social negatives that would have mitigated their influence. During the time when religion and family values were universally adhered to, militant atheists, or free riders, for instance, would have been selected against by the group which would have resulted in them either not reproducing or being driven out of a community. And this also goes for those who engaged in heretical acts within the confines of a community, which would have been considered disreputable. And within the religious context, I use religion as an example due to our historically spiritual behavior, this would have meant that those who transgressed against the rules of the belief system, such as blasphemy or infidelity, would have been either marginalized or met with fatal consequences. In short, Heretics who would have more or less been deemed unfit by the grander population would not have been allowed to coexist peacefully, let alone disseminate their deviant way of life for the masses to observe. This is not to say, however, that all deviants carry deleterious mutations. The key point is that those who rebelled against a system of high fitness which promotes group priorities, monogamous relationships, or maintenance of the status quo, were for whatever reason acting in a way that was seemingly antithetical to the needs of the group who in the grander scheme of things is controlled by the principles of natural selection. This indicates that something is happening within their genome that is engendering low fitness behavior, which suggests an increased likelihood of genetic abnormalities, which can cause one to anti-adapt to their immediate environment. But what happens if these ingrained principles were to shift and become replaced not by the intangible dictations of nature, 
but by the very individuals who are suspected of harboring legacy loads of genetic mutations. Before we engage in this innocuous thought experiment, let us define a few traits which may give indications of a high mutational load. Examples include, but are not limited to, depression, which is known to be to some degree contagious, psychopathic deviance, a phenomenon which tends to prioritize one's own fitness at the expense of group interests, and anti-family or community behavior, such as can be seen in the beautiful ones in Mouse Utopia. Keeping this social epistasis reality in mind, when considering the outcome of a community, should individuals with mutational variants come to power, we can surmise that those who would have otherwise developed normally would move to adopt the qualities which are common among those harboring mutations. Referring back to the militant atheist, or free riders, let us consider that while they were marginalized during times when a religion was more or less a prerequisite for social survival, during times of liberation, such as what we've seen in the post-60s era following the counterculture and sexual revolution, they are given an open platform to act upon, and because atheists on average have a higher IQ than those who are religious, they can use their intelligence to gain social power and infect the population with questionable ideals. Individuals such as these are referred to by Michael Woodley of Mani as spiteful mutants. People who not only engage in behavior that is damaging to themselves, but also to the broader group they belong to, as a result of, among other factors, social epistasis. Consequently, once said population takes control after rising, they can avert the ideals of the culture away from conforming to the good of the group, shifting them from group fitness, 50s era values, and patriotism, to sexual liberation, unrestrained freedom, and tolerance, perhaps even celebration, of various types of low fitness manifestations. By subverting the old norms in favor of a new system which demands a similar necessity of adherence as religion 75 years ago, not only does phenocopying behavior occur among the general population, but also the will to adapt for the very same purposes that 50s era Christians adapted to their community, social and reproductive benefits. Therefore, the old religion gets transmogrified from a system that isn't objectively best for the group as a whole, but something which presents itself as an anomaly dictated by the strange whims of spiteful mutants who would have otherwise been selected against under more natural conditions. Ultimately, humans, while capable of reaching the pinnacle of consciousness, creating beautiful art, music, and architecture, and engaging in wondrous bouts of space exploration, socially, we aren't much different from our animal and insect counterparts. Like the termites, mice, and bees who work toward a collective end for the betterment of their own species, we too have interests that are unique to our own circumstances. By becoming more in tune with not only our immediate interests, but also the complex workings of nature, we can actively use our consciousness, creativity, and ingenuity to ensure that we work toward an end that resembles not a human version of mouse utopia, but something more stable and scientific in its foundation.